setting. Um, and, you know, as she mentioned, we can do questions at the end, but also please, you know, no formalities. If you have uh, thoughts or questions or anything, um, just shout them out and we'll talk. We, uh, we got all the time to hang out here. So let me just switch over to my screen here and I will, there we go. Um, I'll just show you a couple things here. And, you know, again, we can stop and talk throughout these. Um, and let me just give you a couple things to start off with. Um, you know, my background is in community organizing and, and community development and uh, getting local citizens involved in all the things that impact them. And one of the things I'm always doing is looking to see who's missing from the table. And historically, you know, youth often get excluded from that. And uh, so that's part of the work I do with, with UNESCO. It's, it's ensuring youth involvement uh, and youth engagement and things like that. And it's, it's not a, a token kind of thing. And let me just give you a couple examples of why. Um, you know, a lot of people often ask me, like, why do you focus on youth of all the things? And um, there's a lot of reasons. And just here's some of them. Um, if you talk to any of the demographers or any of the international development people, uh, they'll tell you about the youth bulge. But it's one of the biggest demographic shifts we've ever seen. Uh, so now we've got about half the planet, more than half the planet now, uh, under 25 years old. And historically, this group has been the, the biggest agents of change historically. If you look at any of our major social movements, any of our efforts for change and equality and everything else. They've always been at the forefront. So it's a really, really important group. Um, and on top of that, there's a, there's a third of the world that's under 15. Um, so we're talking massive, massive numbers of people here. And a lot of times we have these different little shifts in populations throughout the world. This one by no means is that kind of thing. This is a long-term uh, trend that's going on. Um, it's not just a, a demographic blip or anything like that. So to give you a feel, um, and usually, by the way, when we talk about youth, um, the definitions kind of vary depending on who you're talking to, but it's usually people that are 15 to 25 years old. And um, we're gonna talk here and hang out today for like an hour. So at the end of it, there's gonna be 12,000 more of them. Okay, just to give you a feel for this. Um, now I won't ask everyone to, you know, to put a thumbs up or whatever to say if you're over 25, but if you are, there'll be 6,000 less of us at the end of the day hour. So think about it this way, that's a, that's a net increase of 6,000 youth every single hour. And that's a really, it's an amazing population to tap into. Um, to put it in a, a better way, just to give you some visuals of it, um, this is, these are some maps of the world and the average age of the population. Um, so you can see Europe, overall pretty, pretty much an older continent. Um, if you look at North America, um, pretty much an older one again. As we start getting into places like South America and the Caribbean, it starts getting a little younger. So, and here's the Caribbean again. Um, and as you keep seeing with these, a lot of the youth population is, is, resides in the developing world. At the same time though, we've got massive, massive, massive numbers um, in those places where I showed you, that, showed you that were just older populations. As you get into Asia, really young, um, with the exception of China and, and Australia, a young region. The Middle East, I'm always fascinated by this one. Um, very, very young population. And, uh, you know, I, I had a former grad student from Saudi Arabia and I was, I was shocked when I saw this. And I said, you know, what's the, what's the deal here? And uh, he came back with the, with the statement that, you know, you're in our culture, I mean, your, your worth is placed on what you leave behind, uh, how many children you have, what size of a family, that kind of thing. And we see that in other parts of the world too. Um, you know, sometimes it's driven, large families are driven by, you know, poverty and other things. Uh, other places are driven by um, these cultural aspects of things. So you got these kind of things. Now, here's the one I think is, is really cool. Um, you know, this is what Africa looks like. So anything that's green there is incredibly young. It's an entire continent of young people. Some of this is cultural. Some of it's brought on by um, previous generations being lost to, uh, you know, war, conflict, uh, disease, other things. So it's a whole mix of things. But it's, it's an entirely young population, which is really just an amazing group to, to capture and to be part of things. And as we talk about sustainability and all this other things, um, they're the group to target, they're the group to engage with. And let me just give you a couple other things here. Um, this idea of engaging youth is really critical, I think, to, to all aspects of social change and, and advancing the human condition. Um, but I think it's really important in a lot of other ways. If you go back hundreds of years, thousands of years probably, one of the key things we've seen is that it's always been young people that have been pushing 
the human condition forward, the human race forward. Uh, it's always been that way. They've been the ones who were at the forefront of civil rights, of gender rights, of anti-war, of other things. And, um, and I think that's a pretty cool thing. And I think uh, this idea, the statement of the 1960s of don't trust anybody over 30, um, eh, maybe we can trust people. But I think, you know, I think once people get to a certain point in their lives, there's other priorities. Um, you know, we got mortgages and, and homes and loans and all kinds of other things to look after. And uh, maybe we lose sight of things. But it's the young people that are on the ground all the time that realize these, these critical things. And uh, so I think it's a really, a really cool thing here. And I remember I was, it's funny, one of my, I always tell the story that one of my earliest memories was uh, um, uh, my mother took me to a protest march when I was a kid, I was probably three years old or so. And I just remember thinking like, oh, look at all these people. This is how change happens. This is what makes it go on. And um, I was thinking of all these old people who were probably about 19 or 20, you know, um, but I was three, so it didn't, you know, didn't matter that way. Um, but I think it's fascinating. And that, that sort of got me hooked on a lot of this. And, um, and to tell you the rest of the full story, I, I recently asked my mother a couple of years ago, I said, remember those marches we went to, like, what were we protesting against? And um, she just looked at me kind of blankly and said, well, you know, I don't know. I was looking after you. You were a handful. You were hyperactive. I had to do something with you. So we went out. So like this whole idea that I thought I was based in social justice was probably just, you know, a young mother trying to take care of a rambunctious child. But either way, it was good. Um, now, the good news is that this continues. And as we look through the news and all sorts of other settings, as you, as you keep an eye on things, uh, those people from the 1960s and 70s and 80s there have been, been replaced by an entire new cohort. And they're doing the exact same thing. And again, they're, they're moving it forward. Now, a lot of these pictures here are from all over the world. Um, truth be told, I had kind of thought maybe we'd become a little complacent um, in the United States at least, uh, in terms of youth activism. And uh, it's actually not the case at all. And this is, if you, uh, if you don't recognize this big photo here, this is the um, March for Our Lives March in Washington two years ago, um, a little over two years ago. And uh, think back to all the things you've seen in history courses and everything else, these massive, massive marches on Washington DC to facilitate change. This right here, this picture was the single biggest march ever in Washington. And the average age of the population was 17. That's cool. That's exactly what we should be doing. And that's, that's what youth have always done. That's what they're still doing. Um, and one thing I would, I'd, I'd push back on a little bit too with that is um, sometimes as we're dealing with policymakers and others, um, youth are viewed as, as being vulnerable or we have to talk about what happens if we don't engage them. And we know if we don't engage anybody, the outcomes are going to be really negative. So you're going to have things like violence. You're going to have things like um, extreme poverty, all sorts of other stuff. But the one thing I really want to stress is, is through all of our research and all the work we do with, with the UN and others, um, youth aren't vulnerable. Of this, this, if you take everyone, and we, and we actually did this for the UN once, if you take all the estimates of everyone who signed up for ISIS and Al-Qaeda and gangs and all sorts of other things, it's a numbers game here. Uh, again, there's 3.7 billion youth. Um, even if 10 million of them were engaged in the most wild, extreme activities, you're still talking a hundredth of 1%. Uh, the vast majority are doing what they've always done. They're seeking social change, they're going to school, they're working, they're looking after families, um, all these sort of things. So this idea that, that youth aren't capable of this, it's something we really gotta kind of keep pushing on. Um, they're not vulnerable and uh, they're agents of change as they've always been. So with that in mind, um, one of the things I wanna mention here is, uh, you know, within the UN system and within governments and other settings, uh, a lot of times people have asked for a youth voice in program and policy. And through my experience, it's been two things have happened with that. One, quite honestly, I think some people just say that and they don't really want a youth voice. Um, or more often, I think they, they, they have a situation like this and they don't know how to get a youth voice within it. Uh, it's too messy, it's too complicated, or the structures and the ways they did it in the past just doesn't work. Um, you know, no offense to anyone who's in high school, but you take a high school student and put them on a panel with an ambassador and a president and all this sort of stuff, you know, I'm intimidated beyond belief. I can't imagine what those settings would do to somebody who hasn't had the exposure to that. So think about it. So one of the things we've done is um, we created this Youth as Researchers program. And this was done in, in, con in collaboration with our partners there that I just mentioned. Um, that you can see there from National University of Ireland, Galway, from University of Ulster, but also um, some groups in the UK and the US. And one of the things we did was a lot of our work, we would see that youth were often dismissed. 
that their their voices weren't seen as, you know, you don't know what the real world's like. You don't know what it's like to be out there. All this kind of stuff. And the fact of the matter is they are, and they do. They know those things. Uh, one of the things we found is that it's really, really hard to ignore people if they come to the table with some data. And policymakers really responded to that. So what we did is we came up with this program. And uh, for those of you that have been through grad school, we took one of those mind numbing, boring graduate research methods courses. Um, and what we did is we sat down with young people and had them put it into understandable language. Um, and occasionally I teach a, a stats and methods course. Um, and I found now that the students are going to this curriculum more than a textbook I'll give them. Um, it's much more understandable, much more useful and that sort of thing. But what it is, is it's a brief, really rigorous training and research um, best practices. We provide advice and things like that, but we don't tell them what to study or how to study it. Um, and what we've been finding is that it results in better data, um, a deeper insight. And think about this, because people, a lot of youth and young people are on the ground. And for me to sit in my office and proclaim, I think I know what I'm talking about, it's not nearly as valid and accurate as the people that are seeing it every day in their face on the ground. Um, they get much better data. They also get access to populations I can't. I'm getting too old. People won't talk to me anymore because I'm, I'm too old or whatever else, uh, especially if we're looking into, you know, questionable things like drugs and everything else. No one's going to tell me anything, but they'll tell their friends. And that's valid, useful data. And um, they're coming up with all kinds of innovative ways to do research. Um, and it bridges this idea of um, youth and community action. As I showed you before, all those pictures of young people from all these, these great times in history of changing things. Um, that was action. And with this, by doing the research here, they, they can actually move into action. They don't have to wait for policymakers or other adults or others to tell them what to do. They can take on ownership of this right away. And, uh, and the last thing I would mention here is that uh, uh, their voices can't be ignored. Uh, the nice thing about this, and I'll show you in a second here, but the, the way we set up the program is they do their research. Um, and at the end of it, instead of writing journal articles that quite honestly, nobody ever reads, um, they produce YouTube videos, they produce infographics, uh, they do things like that to get the information and the story out there. If policymakers don't want to listen to it, they can go around them. It's on YouTube, it's on Facebook, it's on everything else. Um, it's empowering on that side, but it makes sure their voices aren't ignored or dismissed as just being idealistic ideas of young people. Uh, they're valid, they're accurate, they're, they're dead on. So that's kind of the program. And, and by the way, all this programming here, this Youth as Researchers program, it's on our, our, uh, our website. It's all free. Uh, none of these things that I'll mention that there's a cost with them. We just do it as part of the, uh, the toolkit out there that people can use and, uh, and we help people use them. So one more quick thing here. Um, not only is this, this program, this youth, this research has actually come out with, um, better data and empowering youth. Um, we've actually got a bunch of other research we've done around it to make sure it's actually working in ways that maybe are beyond what we even thought. Uh, so we've seen increases in empathy civic engagement, self-efficacy, um, critical thinking has been a major one. Uh, again, this idea that I can do, I can tell someone's story, I can collect data um, and tell their story and then I can move that into action. Really cool thing. Um, and uh, a big thing I think is important too, you know, I mean, just think now even in the, the whole COVID crisis, uh, we're all kind of scratching our heads at times to think of what can we do? What can I, you know, what can I do to change the world or help people? And you don't even know where to begin. Uh, one of the things that we've seen with this is that people come out of, by doing this kind of work, uh, any sense of cynicism by youth dissipates. Uh, it's really nice. They come out of it believing and knowing that they can change the world and they can change discourse and dialogue and everything, um, which is really cool and they can. So with that, <clears throat> what I thought I would do is just show you two, two examples. Um, and these don't deal with sustainability terribly, but th this idea, I'll talk about some examples that do in a minute. Um, but I guess before the, I, I show these, any, any thoughts, questions, anything you want to bring up? I saw a few of the, the question things pop up. No? Okay. You can save the good stuff to last. Okay. Um, so one of the things, one of the, like I said, we developed this in, in partnership with our group in Ireland, our UNESCO group there. And uh, one of the things we, as, as European Union planning and all sorts of other things were going on, uh, a lot of people hear Ireland and they think harps and leprechauns and Guinness and, you know, all sorts of stuff. And um, what people forget is that, is that Ireland joined the European Union in 1973 and they were, they were categorized as a third world country then. And um, 
you know, they've grown, they've had busts and booms and everything else, but no one really thinks of things, especially things like homelessness and stuff like this. Um, again, youth are right on the ground and they're, they're paying attention to things like mental health, like poverty, like other things that may be hidden and other stuff. So this is a quick one they did, um, uh, one of the results of their, of their research. We've got about 30 or 40 of these and they're on our webpage and you can look at any of them. Uh, they're all there. Um, and uh, you can see how this goes. And if, if any of you know the Irish actor, uh, Killian Murphy from Peaky Blinders and Batman and those movies, um, uh, he's actually a patron of the center there. And he does all the voiceovers for this and works with youth to, to, to do the research and other things. So let me show you one of the videos. The Leitrim Youth Council Committee, Corlan and Og, set out to explore youth perceptions on homelessness in Ireland. This topic was chosen by the committee in 2015 after the members consulted with their peers in the local youth cafe, youth clubs and student councils. They found that this was an issue that young people were discussing and curious about. During this consultation, young people stated that they were never asked their opinions on the serious issue of homelessness and what image they have of homeless people. As one young Corlin and Oak committee member stated, they would like to identify if the young people of Ireland today have a real understanding of homelessness. Students in first year and transition year in every secondary school in County Leitrim were surveyed. In total, 306 questionnaires were completed. Here are the research findings.
here are group's recommendations. Information leaflets should be available in the Citizens Information Centre and Library in the county. Information on what help is available for homeless people should be advertised and available locally. There should be a Facebook campaign to highlight help available for young people who are concerned about becoming homeless. Okay, I'll move on from there. I just noticed my, uh, as I was doing this here, um, I have this list of all the people who are on board right now, the little screen things. Can you see that on, on my end for my screen sharing? I want to make sure I'm not blocking no. half the screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had this thing that I probably was cut, cutting out half the videos there. Um, so that was just one example. I, I want to give you another one in, um, uh, from Pennsylvania that we did in North Philadelphia. And uh, this one here, uh, there's a couple things with it just to give you a feel. This is, this is in the, what they call the Temple, North Philly Temple Corridor. It's uh, uh, the area around Temple University, but, but North Philadelphia there. It's one of the um, most socioeconomically deprived areas in the country. Uh, if you look at any of the demographics, it's everything from incredibly higher levels of poverty, violence, HIV rates. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the toughest places in the country. And uh, um, we did the program to, here with youth and they were actually quite younger, but they were much older in terms of their lived experience. And uh, they, they, of all the issues they looked at, you know, and again, sitting in my office, I figured, ah, oh, they probably want to look at poverty. They probably want to look at this, that, and the other. Um, they came back and said, we want to look at, at basically racial profiling and community violence, um, community and police violence against each other. And uh, let me show you what they did. And um, uh, as you're doing this, pay attention. There's, there's one fellow in here. He has a red uh, a checkered shirt. I'll tell you about him at the end. So. I love my community. They have multiple things to do here and it's just feel like family. around police, I felt scared that they might do something to me. At first, I felt misunderstood about them. I felt like they didn't have no heart for people. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent of police officers surveyed says that they are not afraid in our community. We asked the community who is responsible for creating negative stereotypes. The community is almost evenly split on this question. 78% of the community says they have not experienced police brutality. 88% of the police survey feels alert in the neighborhoods where they work. All police officers surveyed feel that youth interviews are productive.
Our data shows that police officers are not afraid of the community. Our data also shows that our community is not afraid of the community. The next step is to keep this conversation going. And we can do this by letting the youth in our community and the police communicate more often. Don't research about us! So let me just uh, just throw in a couple things around that one here, and just I think it highlights some of the um, some of the value and the importance of, of having you do research. Um, and all you know, many of the folks I work with and myself, you know, we do research all the time, and we still make all kinds of mistakes. We all we, we miss all sorts of things. There's all sorts of limitations. But one of the really cool things with this, and again, we don't we don't tell youth what to study. We never ever ever will tell them to study something or not study something. So you know, when they picked basically racial profiling, I thought, okay, it's gonna be messy. This, you know, Philadelphia Inquirer will be calling Penn State, but it's okay, this is what they want. And um, as they started crafting this, we gave them minimal, if they asked for advice, we gave it to them. But as they were, they were kind of crafting uh, questionnaires and things like that, um, or interviews for the police, uh, they came around it to themselves and, and they developed this real, and we've seen this with our groups, this real um, joy in the whole art and craft of doing research. Uh, they got that they were telling someone's story and they got the responsibility that they should do everything in their power to do it right. Um, and this wasn't us telling them to do it again. And one of the really cool things that came out is they, they were crafting things to, to basically interview the police and all sorts of others. Uh, and they said, well, you know, hold on a second. And they did this themselves. They said, if we're going to talk about Black Lives Mattering, we've got to figure out, okay, there's, there's a police issue here, but we also have to figure out why we're killing as many of ourselves in our own neighborhood. So we got to do a community survey and we got to compare the two. And I just thought that was just incredibly insightful, incredibly right on. And, uh, and that's what they did. And then um, the results of this, that, that video there is being shown now in the police academy. Uh, it's used as a basis now for some community police uh, coalitions and, and dialogues going on. Um, so it's making some difference. Um, and that's cool. And that's, that's what the purpose was. The other thing is just completely interesting and unique about that case. Um, I asked you to pay attention for the, for the guy named Kevin there who had the checkered shirt. Um, every time as we did any of this, Kevin was my main nemesis. He every day would tell me how uncool I was, how bad my shoes were, how, you know, I was old and bald, I mean, you name it. We, he just tormented me the whole time. We were, we were good friends, but he, he was, he just drove me mad. Um, we did this, this, this program here about, I guess almost three years ago now. And we did it, for those of you that know Philadelphia or know anything about it, um, um, about three months after we did this, uh, a miracle happened. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl. Uh, they'd been waiting about a thousand years for this to happen, and the entire town and everyone nearby went berserk for the parades and celebrations. So Kevin and a few of his friends uh, were in downtown Philadelphia with the other five million people, and uh, just sitting there having a great time. And he noticed a group of cops um, police officers, uh, looking over at him and they came over and said, and the one guy came, one officer came over and said, don't I know you? And usually historically that would have meant, meant a, a stop and frisk. That would have meant, um, you know, let's see if you have any weapons or drugs or anything on you. And of course, Kevin said, oh no, trust me, you've never seen me. You don't know me. You don't know me for anything. And he said, no, no, I think I do. And Kevin kept saying, no, no, you don't know me at all. And then he said, no, no, you were one of those youth, youth researchers I met with a couple months ago. Um, how's everything going with that? What happened with the project? How's it going? And all of a sudden they had this dialogue going on. So this interactive effect of building um, connections across groups um, is a really cool thing. And plus the fact that it's based on data and all sorts of other stuff. So th those are some examples. I have a few others here that are on our web website. I won't show you the videos because some of them are in development, but you can look at them. And there's some fact sheets and other things they put together. Uh, but these were ones that were done to Penn State. And uh, uh, one of the things that was done by a group of students uh, was looking at sustainability programs on campus, uh, recycling and environmental behaviors, uh, practices uh, in the dorms, that sort of thing. Um, two groups, and again, we don't tell them what to do or not to do. Two groups um, on their own independently came up with the idea that food insecurity on Penn State campus is, um, is a massive issue. And uh, it's funny, and I, I, I don't say this, you know, and, and they did some great research and you can see what they came up with. Um, and I don't say this, you know, joking or dismissively towards administrators or others. Um, 
but I, we showcased this and I had a few administrators from, from different parts of the campus come and say, well, how could there be food insecurity on campus? Look at all the dining halls we have and look at all the opportunities for food and look at all the things downtown and everything else. And I said, yeah, but the students are saying, yeah, there's a problem here. And they, they just couldn't get it. So finally I said to them, do you remember when you were in university? And I don't know about you, but I lived on ramen noodles for about five years. And um, I found every possible creative way to make them because they were about five cents a packet. And that's what I lived on. And for all of them, this light bulb went off in their head that, oh yeah, yeah, you know, we, we, we may think that students are, uh, um, have more money than they know what to do with and it's just not the case. And as it comes to food sustainability and other stuff, it's really a critical thing there. So we can, we can talk more about those. Um, last thing I'll say with this and then I'll wrap up. Uh, we're also doing this program now at an, an accelerated play, pace uh, globally in response to COVID. So we're doing it with UNESCO in um, uh, Australia, South Africa, uh, US, um, Western Europe, uh, Thailand, uh, Myanmar, a few other places. And the focus is on, on how COVID has uniquely impacted different you know, people's lives in different contexts. Uh, but one of the things we're also looking at it for, and it seems a few of the groups are coming forward now uh, with the idea of how can we um, adapt sustainably. We've got the situation now where everyone's economy is blown to pieces. And in the past, it may have been much more difficult to, uh, um, you know, to think about retooling industry and all sorts of other stuff because it'd be so disruptive. Well, everything is completely disruptive beyond belief. And that was an opportunity to really um, change the dial. I mean, we've seen all the pictures of how, uh, with none of us going outside, how pollution is disappearing, how we can actually see stars again, and we can actually see buildings again in certain places. Um, youth are picking up on that like you wouldn't believe, and they see this as an opportunity now. So they're gonna be doing some research there. Um, let me just give you a couple things to wrap up here with. Um, one of the things I, I would like to mention is, um, you know, by, by using this information, by using the data that youth come up with, uh, how they can act and why they should act, but also, also adults should act uh, and help with this. Now, I know you've, um, you've all read all the great scholars and usually presentations like this are full of references and citations from the most eminent researchers and other things. Um, and you can go dig those up, but I'm gonna go with a different one. Um, does anybody know who this is? No, if you don't know who it is, it's Henry Rollins. Uh, he's one of the, the, the godfathers of punk rock. Um, and he's also an amazing social activist, um, um, both environmentally, but also socially and other things. And uh, I caught this great, um, I don't know, spoken word, concert, whatever you want to call it, uh, talk he gave recently. And uh, he said a lot of great things in it, but I'll show you the one things that really came out of it that I thought were just wonderful. Um, so there's, not only is there a role for youth to take on with these things, there's a role for, for us over 25, um, those over 30, the people you shouldn't listen to or trust, the ones, uh, you know, older people that have something to offer. And this is, I think, a role that we should be doing. And uh, you can see what he said here, but basically the idea is that if we're gonna facilitate change, We've got to keep everyone off balance. And young people historically have done that. They're the ones who've marched and questions and, and done everything else. Um, and a key thing we have to stress is that you're not alone, that we've got your back. Um, we'll take the fight for you. You know, I'm at a stage in my career where I can take the punches for you. And uh, I like doing that. Um, and also this idea that, you know, these young people that are marching in, in response to gun violence, in response to environmental needs, to sustainability, that look at, you're never even going to meet me. Uh, but I'm your biggest fan and I'm going to help you in ways you can't even imagine. And we've been waiting for you to come around and do this. Um, so don't be discouraged by this. And then this is the thing that I, I just thought summed it up great. Um, you know, he says, as a guy who's hurtling towards 60, you know, the jobs of us that are our job is to clear the way for you. Let us take some of the punches for you. Let us clear the road for you and you come in and do great things. Um, so that's, you know, that's, 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 I think some really good ideas there. And I really like the thought of that. Um, and again, here's part of the reason, and that applies for all of us too, under 25. Um, you know, these are the amazing people I get to work with, um, that are writing, fighting for everything from change to sustainability to you name it. Um, and these are all people, you know, in that 18 to 25 year old range. Um, you have a role too, to kind of clear the path for this, this next batch of hooligans that are coming up. Um, they're the ones that are going to do great things. Um, again, 6,000 more than were just born in the time we've been talking. Um, they are coming and they expect us to help. And if we don't, we better get out of the way. And uh, it's a really cool thing. So with that, I'm just gonna, uh, i just mention one last thing here. We have a, a global network of UNESCO chairs 
uh, which um, basically on almost every continent, you know, hundreds of faculty and universities that we've pulled together all in this realm of things. And one of the reasons we set this up is that we could be a fast reaction group um, for issues affecting youth and communities and other things. Um, and if there's ever any need or interest for any of you, uh, please call on us, please connect with us. We'll plug you into any of these groups. We'll talk about different things we can do to, to help with the efforts you're doing. Um, again, all the work we do is through universities and through UNESCO, it's all free. We don't, you know, there's none of that stuff. Uh, so this is just, you know, some of the depth and reach we have. And the idea is we can move fast on different things and, and we can help where we can. So, so with that, I'm gonna shut up. Um, one of the other things I'll do is I'll leave this here for a second. This is, please, please, please reach out anytime. Um, you can get our information on the website there. There's uh, um, our content, our contact information was sent out, Twitter, everything else here, but uh, don't be a stranger. So uh, I'll leave that there and uh, I will stop my screen and uh, I don't know, why don't we talk for a while. Perfect, thanks Mark. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to throw them in the chat or you can do the raise hand function um, and I can find you and call on you and unmute you so that you can talk directly to Mark. Um, but to get started, uh, Mark, would you mind sharing some of the websites that you were mentioning before to the research projects, to the youth and researchers programming? Yes. Um, yeah, it, like um, we've made it very simple. If you go to our website, which is uh, unescochair.psu.edu, um, and you go on there, there's, there's a whole series of um, everything from our research publications to other things. But on the main page there, there's a uh, youth as researchers um, uh, drop down menu. And it's got the, the we've two years of, of work here. We've got a couple of other years that are in the works that aren't online yet. But um, uh, the one there, you can see all the videos. Um, uh, some of them did reports, some of them did uh, infographics. Um, um, some of them just did storytelling. Um, so uh, there's, there's, there may not be as much there, but they're all there. And then there's also a link on the same page to um, uh, the Child and Family Research Center at uh, National University of Ireland, Galway. Uh, and they've done another probably 20 or 30 projects. Um, and they're everything from, um, from poverty to um, LGBT youth, uh, the issues they're facing to, um, the, the list goes on and on and on. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're all right there. Uh, and and on both of those two, there's links to the curriculum um, and the materials. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Um, so one question that we have is, how would you suggest that youth, either at Penn State or still in high school, reach out to get involved in the youth research project, um, specifically in Northern PA, Southern tier of New York? Yes, um, give us a call, send me an email. Um, what we can do, uh, there's a couple different ways we can do it. Uh, we've done it, by the way, uh, with uh, State College High School, um, we have two groups there, um, and uh, it worked great. The other thing that, you know, usually the way we've done these is we've, we've either done like a train the trainer somewhere uh, or we've done like the initial trainings ourselves. Uh, one of the things that's gonna be rolling out in the next month maybe, we're really fast tracking it, is that um, because of, of COVID and everything else, uh, we had to put things together in ways that um, we could do training. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually record a bunch of trainings and uh, people wherever they are where they can get a Wi-Fi signal in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, whatever part of the world um, can do it. So each module is gonna be broken up um, and taught by somebody from a different region. Um, so it's, it's completely global, with, but that stuff there will be there to help. Um, but then at the same time we do, um, there's, a, there's a couple other things we do that um, we'd like to kind of provide support for. And uh, again, it's free. Uh, the support side of it would be, you know, if you need any advice as, as you're groups are designing questionnaires or whatever, you know, they want us to look at them, sure, we'll do that. Or if they have questions on how to do a certain thing or whatever else. Uh, one of the things we found, um, and again, with that Philadelphia group is great. Um, people have taken on this whole, because it's not linked to a course and you're not getting a grade and everything else, um, people have developed this, this love for the whole art and craft of research. So I had a bunch of those folks from Philadelphia coming to me after it was done saying, well, oh, you know, I, I wish I sampled differently. I wish, you know, all this kind of completely geeky research talk and they were saying no oh, i think we had a thing here so people are really really aware of that now they're reaching out to us to say you know give us some tips on maybe how we might sample or do other stuff um so yeah we have that the one last thing i would mention too and, and we have a module on it but we're really really serious about it is um you know any research that any, any of us do at a university 
we have to go through an ethics um, review board to make sure that we're not doing any harm. And uh, one of the things we set up is a small group of us uh, that can just do this sort of informally for youth uh, research groups. Um, any of us who've been doing research for 100 years, uh, we still make mistakes. You get so caught up and excited by the research, you don't realize that you're potentially outing the local drug dealer or you're doing whatever or, or sharing information that uh, maybe people don't want shared uh, about themselves or other things. So we put together a program there and a, and a fast track process to help with that, um, uh, just so people are so aware of what might happen. Long answer to a short question. Awesome, thank you. So we have another question coming live. Let's see. Uh, th thanks for the talk. Um, you talk you. all about people 16 to 18 and older students doing stuff to help. What can younger people like me do? Yes, you can do the same thing. Um, one of the things we originally kind of set this up um, uh, just for that age range because you know, that's what the UN would focus on. Um, the really cool thing is uh, the group in Philadelphia there, um, they were really, really interested in doing this. And, and uh, the average age there was probably about 12. Um, some, of the, some of the people that were involved in it were, would have been even younger. And um, um, it worked just fine. So that's, um, we, could, we can do it with any types of group. Um, the other thing too is that, you know, the, the research is designed to give, uh, give young people of all ages a, um, um, you know, a little bit of power. Um, if, if your ability to come and say, look, I really kind of looked at this critically, um, makes it a lot harder for adults or people that don't want to listen uh, to not listen. Um, it's very hard. So I think there's, there's lots of ways you can, you, you can use it in different ways. Um, the key thing, the reason, you know, the reason we did this is, you know, prior to these times when we're all locked in our houses, uh, the rest of the time, um, young people of all ages are on the ground 24 hours a day. They're out there in their communities. They're out there with their friends. They're out there experiencing the world. They know a lot more of what's happening than those of us that sit in our offices or our cars or other things. Um, so your ability just to provide insight into what's going on, who's, who's being impacted, even take, take this virus going around now. Um, you know, your ability to be talking with your friends and others uh, and say, look, I've got a lot of friends who, you know, they have old family members who feel isolated. They have, you know, people that can't get medicine or food or whatever else. Your ability to start keeping track of that and conveying that to, to anybody that will listen. And whether that's through, you know, telling family and friends and local officials or putting it on Facebook or putting it on Twitter or emailing it to anybody that will listen um, is just tremendously powerful. So I think, you know, the same kind of thing can be done there. There's no, no shortage of opportunities for good actions, in, especially in this environment. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Um, another question that we have is, how did you become UNESCO chair? Well, that's a long story. How much time you got? Um, <laughs> we got all day. <laughs> actually, um, the way it happened is, uh, um, long story short, um, I, like I said before, my background has really been community organizing, community development. And uh, when I finally decided to go back to school and get my, my PhD and stay in academia, um, I did a big research project that looked at community development um, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, in a bunch of communities in Pennsylvania and a bunch of communities in Ireland. Um, Ireland had a really unique history of community-based action um, around a lot of things. So I did this big study there and I ended up working with a lot of people in Ireland. And uh, one of them is a um, you know, very, very good friend. And when you go to the, the website for the National University of Ireland there, um, it's a guy named Pat Dolan. And, uh, he was a social worker for most of his life and then went back to school and uh, now runs this child and family research center. So the, the two of us really hit it off great and we, we did a lot of work, continue to do a lot of work over the years, you know, research, writing articles, talking to anybody that would listen to us. Um, and uh, that got on the radar of, of UNESCO because we were dealing a lot with youth. We were dealing a lot with youth in international areas. Um, and uh, that became an interest with there. So eventually they approached Pat to, uh, to be the first UNESCO chair in uh, the Republic of Ireland. And uh, um, so we continued doing more and more work uh, around UNESCO. And uh, they approached Penn State um, about eight years, seven years ago now, and said, would you be interested? And then we went through a whole process of applying and um, that's how it happened. It was, uh, there certainly wasn't a plan for it. It just kind of came about, but it's been great because it really allows us to, you know, 
part of the reason there's this chair program. There's, they've been in place for 25 years now or so. And the idea was um, that, you know, international agencies, UNESCO, UNICEF, uh, the UN itself, uh, they wanted to be in touch with groups that were doing places like Penn State, for example, that has extension and outreach to a really high level. Uh, that they wanted to work with places that were doing, you know, really cutting edge research and then getting it used on the ground. And um, that's kind of what we do. So it's nice to be able to do research or develop programs and have them used within a couple months, you know, in Africa or Asia or other side of the planet. So it's, that's what we do. That's awesome. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? I feel like I've gotten all the ones from the chat that I've seen so far. Okay, and you know, awesome. I know ideas will be popping up and things like that as, as often do after these things. Um, you know, please, anytime. Contact Maddie, contact myself. Um, uh, my email is just uh, UNESCO chair at psu.edu. Um, it's on the website there. Um, my office number, my cell phone, everything else. Give me a call, send me an email. Um, you can talk through any of this stuff. Or if anything sounds interesting, um, you know, the other thing, we do, we do a lot of work, um, again, in lots of areas. And, and again, it's, it's designed to be used everywhere um, and free. So as you look at our webpage, um, there's, there's a leadership, youth leadership program we have, there's um, youth community development program, a whole bunch of different things. And, uh, you know, we're delighted to share them and, and get them used however you like. So. Uh, please, please don't be a stranger and just come back to us. Awesome, thank you so much, Mark. Um, so it looks like there's no more questions, but Mark said that he can stick around for a few minutes. So if anyone has additional thoughts or questions, feel free to hang around and ask him then, um, as well as reach out to him days after this talk if anything comes up. Uh, but with that being said, next week, we have our last stability showcase for the year. Um, it will be Ted Alter, who is a professor at Penn State. Um, he's also the co-director for the Center of Economic and Community Development here at Penn State. And he'll be talking about uncertainty, community and sustainability, um, particularly around the topics of coronavirus and um, that direct correlation to climate change. So with that being said, thank you so much, Mark, for coming and joining us today um, virtually, and as well as to all the attendees who came out today as well. Thank you so much for Have having me. Have a good weekend, guys. Being there and Make sure you tech, check out Ted next week. He's brilliant. And the work he does uh, connects him with a lot of the stuff we've done. And we work together on things. And um, he's one of the most inspirational, cool guys you'll ever meet. So it's great. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you. Great. I'll stick around if anyone wants to chat. So. <laughs>